So um, what longitudinal model should I choose? Now, I want to mention that this is, um, these slides were prepared in collaboration with Ilya Gooden, who is a postdoc at University of Texas. And we're going to be talk, I'll be talking about an extended empirical example, which is a, a paper that we published in demography once we get over the more general questions of the different longitudinal models uh, that are there that we, we might be able to use. So let me get this. There we go. That worked. Okay. So first of all, um, we are either blessed or cursed with now so much more longitudinal data than we had, say, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, something like that. There, it used to be that we would uh, complain that there wasn't enough longitudinal data, and now we're complaining that we have so much and so much detail, it's a little hard to know, you know what to do with it. And so um, this talk is going to provide you some ideas on that. And what I've tried to do is give it a um, applied angle to this or applied feel to it. And I just say that there are common theoretical patterns and models that we can get out of the social behavioral science literature, some ideas that reoccur in many different subject matter areas. I also will be looking at an extended empirical example to show you how um, we have put this into practice and then just draw upon, out some conclusions on it. So this is just some um, examples of why they use data sets that are based in the states. I know that in Germany, as well as many other countries, there's uh, quite important longitudinal studies as well. So lots of us have a uh, choice and the opportunity to work on such data sets. Now, what you sometimes get as advice, you know, in terms of choosing a longitudinal model is people say, well, what, what does the theory say? What do the substantive arguments say? That would be great. You know, if we really had theory that was so clear that it said this should be a quadratic growth curve model because we think there's individual starting points, we think it's a, a, a quadratic type curve that could capture this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Or this should be a fixed effects model. You know, this makes the most sense uh, because we have these time varying variables, we want to control for time invariant variables. The fact is, if we're going to be serious and honest about it, there's little to no guidance from the theory and the substantive literature as to the specific model choice that we have. And as a result, model choice is more often based on fads in the literature. And, it, and the literature could be very specific. It could be within your particular field. They're always using growth curve models. So you use a growth curve model and you don't have to defend it. You just apply it. Um, or you, even in the same field and the example that we'll be talking about, uh, I'll be talking about later on self-reported health. We, in an article that we published uh, recently, we have a table that shows the different longitudinal models that were used for the same outcome variables. You know, people's report on uh, their own health, their subjective assessment of health. And it's a range of different models. But it occurs without any kind of defense of why one was chosen over the others. And then, of course, what program is available and what does it allow us to estimate? So part of the time, the choice is dictated by the statistical programs. I don't think these are good ways of doing science. You know, just following the fads, seeing what other people did, and seeing what statistical software is there. So. Um, what's the cost of using the wrong model? Well, science has a number of different purposes. One purpose, perhaps one of the, the simplest and perhaps undervalued one, is just describing longitudinal processes or trajectories. Well, if you've got the wrong model, you may be inadequately and uh, inaccurately describing even that process. Many other studies, our goal is to test hypotheses. We have hypotheses as to what's occurring with a particular outcome, what factors influence that outcome. 
Well, if we've got the wrong longitude in the model, in a sense, we may have floating around some unobserved confounders that are parameters from the correct longitude in the model that are correlated with some of the covariates that we're looking at. So we're gonna have faulty tests of our hypotheses. And closely related, we're gonna have inaccurate assessments of the causal influences on an outcome. Finally, if you're interested in policies or predictions, if you have a misspecified model, there too, you may end up with defective, inaccurate policies due to you not taking the trouble to really see if this is the right model for a particular data set. So what I wanna to turn to now, I, so I wanna to turn to some ideas that are common across a number of different substantive areas. And one set of arguments focuses on the idiosyncratic uh, nature of human behavior, actions, uh, attitudes, etc. And the arguments here go along the lines that people behave in particular contexts. And that context depends on who's around. Is the person alone? Are there other people around? What's the nature of the people? Are there people you know or not? The places you are? and what's expected in those different places, the broader social environment. And the idea is that there may be a fair amount of instability in these contexts. And this is gonna create instability in the outcomes. And it's almost like any outcome that you're looking at is going to be largely driven by things that appear to be fairly idiosyncratic. So it's really hard to capture a systematic effect. If that is the case, in a sense, what we're saying is that if Z, and let me just explain notation here that I'll be using, Z-I-T, I stands for the individual or the unit that you're studying. It could be an organization or something of that nature. T stands for the time period. And the alpha T, this is a time-specific mean value and the epsilon it, this is a disturbance or error term for the ith individual at the teeth time point. So this is just saying basically z depends on a constant that varies over time, plus a whole bunch of idiosyncratic characteristics. Now the path diagram of this is a little strange looking. I'm showing it here for five waves of data, z1 through z5. And all it would consist of is no connection between these variables. It's just that we've got this error term plus a constant, depending on the time period, which I'm not showing in the diagram here, the constant. And so this is one set of arguments, more idiosyncratic, spontaneous occurrence. Uh, for that self-rated health, there's some suggestions in that literature that people are gonna respond to that question, um, you know, uh, I ate too much and you, I get this survey and I'm just responding, I don't feel you know, great, I don't feel very well. Um, that's not like a permanent condition, a permanent representation, that's just sort of what's going on at a particular time that I'm asked that question. Another set of arguments we refer to as enduring influence. This is almost opposite. This are a set of arguments that suggest that people are fairly stable in their characteristics. You know, the degree of happiness, you know, maybe somebody is very upbeat most of the time, um, exhibiting, you know, positive affect, and that's fairly stable over time. And this goes throughout their lifetime across this longitudinal survey. Depression and anxiety could be like that too, that this is a relatively stable characteristic, someone with uh, anxiety um, issues, that this characterizes across all the waves of the data in the longitudinal uh, data set. In the example I've been, uh, be, will continue to deal with perceived health, people may have sort of an enduring assessment of themselves. Um, so for example, on that self-reported health, the person may consider themselves a healthy person. And part of it is, even as they age, 
the reference is other people of their age group. So they may have some condition, but they still view themselves as healthier than someone else. Or it could be the opposite, somebody who always feels they're, um, uh, for objective or subjective reasons, that they're always less healthy than others in their reference group. So this argument is one of stability. And this um, relative constant nature of the assessment is driven by personality characteristics, uh, perhaps genetics, the reference groups, et cetera. So this is a second kind of thread of ideas you'll find in many different substantive areas, kind of an enduring influence. This equation and path diagram are an attempt to represent that idea. The ZIT is the same as it was before. This is for the ith person at the teeth wave. There's a time bearing intercept. So that constant is there that can vary over time. This is the enduring influence, kind of the stable uh, aspect of that person's position on this outcome. And the epsilon IT are these departures from that. In this diagram, I'm assuming that the stable enduring effect has the same impact on people over time. Uh, there are some models that uh, colleagues and I have worked with where we allow that to vary and estimate to see, uh, test whether it's stable over time or not. But the key idea is this constant time invariant um, force that is driving responses across all of the waves of data. Now, another idea that is quite common is one of lagged effects. The variable's current value depends on its previous or lagged value. So how much you made last year is probably gonna be pretty well determined or influenced by how much you made last, um, I'm sorry, how much you made this year is pretty well determined by how much you made last year or how much smoking or drinking was done last week can probably be pretty well determined by how much drinking or smoking was done in the prior week. And for the self-rated health, your self-rated health assessment today probably is partially influenced by your self-rated health assessment from yesterday. So it's a lag effect that you could view this as either a habit representation of a habit driving it or a type of social inertia, driving beliefs and behaviors. So if you want to change, if you're studying an outcome that is primarily driven by lagged effects, if you wanna make a change, you have to intervene on that variable and then its influence will carry forward on future values. This is a path diagram representing that for a linear model, ZIT is the same. The random inter, I mean, sorry, the time bearing intercept is the same. This row is the autoregressive coefficient. It gives the impact of the lag value of Z on the current value of Z. And the epsilon IT is still capturing all those other influences um, on Z that aren't explicitly in the model. I'm having a little lag here when I press that button. There we go. Here's another set of perspectives that is in a variety of fields, which we refer to as kind of a life cur uh, course perspective. This is talking about different stages in individuals' lives and the fact that there are common patterns that occur at different ages. So we have school transitions would be a major life event that occurs for many individuals. Could be a high school to college or an elementary school to uh, high school. Could be work transitions, first job, promotions, switching jobs, retirements, or family formation, marriage, first birth, you know, second birth, et cetera. So what this life course perspective does is it says, well, we. We, these may not occur at the exact same time for individuals. Their starting points may not be at the exact um, spot. 
but these common events create common effects for people as they age and go through the life course. But there's individual variability as well. And the, um, the growth curve model, let's see if I can get it back to that one. There we go. So the growth curve model, and let's talk about it in an equation form. ZIT is the same. This is the wave of data for the i individual. Now, instead of the alpha T, we have alpha I. So what that means is that different people have different starting points on this alpha I variable. It varies across individuals, not over time. And then lambda T is just a time trend variable. And beta i is a different slope. And notice it has a subscript of i, which means that it's allowing different people to have different slopes. And epsilon i t is just all those other idiosyncratic factors. So what this linear growth curve model is allowing and something that fits in with the life course perspective is it says people can have different starting points in whatever outcome you're looking at, and they can have different rates of change. And this model is allowing you know, both of those things. Now, there are variants of this life course perspective because the linear model may not capture what's going on depending on the range of years you're looking at for an individual. So we can have something that's curvilinear. Uh, a very common way of trying to capture that is the quadratic growth curve model. And this diagram is just representing the quadratic growth curve model, as is the equation. It differs only from the linear growth curve by adding this lambda t, the time trend variable squared, times a separate slope that can vary by individual. This is just the path diagram of it. Um, I imagine a number of you in the audience are already aware of this if you uh, do SEM work, that the random intercept, the alpha, the random linear slope, the beta one, and the quadratic slope, that's random, beta two, can be represented as latent random variables uh, in a structural equation model. And that's all that this is doing. So that equation, if you prefer, you can look at the equation or the diagram is representing the same type of ideas. Again, this could fall under the life course perspective, but it's allowing one form of curvilinearity. This is another form of curvilinearity you could have. This is with a freed loading growth curve model, where rather than having the growth curve be just a set linear trend, we could just say that the random slope first coefficient is zero, the second coefficient is one, but then estimate lambda three, lambda four, lambda five for the remaining three waves to give a little more flexibility on the shape of the curve that's being followed. This can be helpful when you don't have a smooth quadratic type shape of change and you're not that certain as to the nature of the change that occurs over the period of time that you're studying. It is another form of a curvilinear model but it still is consistent with a life course perspective. So what I've shown you so far are ideas that reoccur in different literatures on different outcomes that you might study. And I've showed you some models that can correspond to those different ideas. Well, sometimes those ideas don't operate alone. You know, sometimes more than one of those processes that I described may be co-occurring, may be necessary to fully describe the outcome that you're looking at. And this leads us to um, hybrid models. And I'll give you one example of this. This is something that a colleague and I, uh, Patrick Curran, um, developed some time ago, the autoregressive latent trajectory model. It combines two ideas, and if we're going to relate it to these theoretical uh, concepts, the lagged effects idea that I talked about, and the life course idea that I talked about. 
different starting points and rates of change, and previous values influencing current values. So you can see here that we have elements of both of those theoretical perspectives, where yes, your current value on the variable is partially influenced by your past value, but in addition, there is a um, alpha i, a characteristic that influences these outcomes over time that differs across individuals combined with a um, rate of change, different rates of change. Another colleague and I, Bianconcini, um, Italian statistician, we um, developed this latent variable alt model as a way of generalizing the alt model so that we can include as special cases, a wide variety of other models. So fixed and random effects, latent growth curve, latent change score models, autoregressive, uh, cross lag models, um, and um, a general panel model that uh, developed with another uh, colleague. So all of these can be viewed as special cases of this latent variable alt model. This is a uh, path diagram of it, one form of it. And let me just take a moment to explain what is being done in this representation. One thing to notice is that the outcome variable that's in your data set are these y's, yi1, yi2, through yi5. With the latent variable op model, we allow measurement error in those indicators. So we want to see what the relationship is controlling for the measurement error that are in the indicators. For example, on that self-reported health um, running example that I've been referring to, certainly there's going to be measurement error in that. In fact, we've done other articles that suggest its reliability is around 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So we don't want to run an analysis where we're not taking account of something that has at best moderate reliability. So we can allow for the measurement error in those Y variables, and therefore look at the latent, the, the self-reported health correcting for measurement error, its autoregressive relations, as well as allowing a um, random uh, intercept term, this constant term that can vary over individuals, and this random slope term. And by setting different parameters to zero in this model, we can end up with simpler models and test whether they are perfectly adequate for the data or not. So, uh, and I should mention that although this latent variable all model is quite general, um, a class of models that it, um, we've not yet um, incorporated into it, but might be possible, are models that allow for autoregression of error terms or cross lags of error terms. And I'm just showing it here with one series of variables. In the paper where we presented this, we show how you can have multiple indicators of this latent variable, how you can have multiple series of data allow cross lagged effects between the different latent variables, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the strategy for model selection? You're trying to figure out what to fit. Well, here is one possibility. First, fit the model that is what you suspect of being adequate for your data. Then you could add terms that are in the latent variable alt model and confirm that they're either zero or not. If they're non-zero, that raises questions about your specification and you might wanna consider some alternative. Or let's say you're in a situation where you don't have um, a specific theory that's dictating a particular model, but there's different longitudinal models in the literature for the same outcome. You have the same experience that we did. You collect together other studies of the identical outcome and you're finding, wow, this person used a growth curve, this is a fixed effects model, you know, how do I choose between those? Well, compare the fit of those models to each other, and then compare the fit of those models that are being used in literature to the latent variable alt. If you don't get any improvement, 
fine, you have even further justification for choosing one of those models that's used in the literature. On the other hand, if you find that there are some additional parameters that are not in those models that are being used in the literature, this leads you to think, well, maybe this is not the best model. You know, maybe these people did not systematically test to see what was the best. Finally, if you're in a situation where there's no model suggested, you know, maybe it's a new area for longitudinal data, you could fit the general latent variable alt and look for non-significant terms that could simplify the model. All right, so let's, let's look at this as an empirical uh, example, which we did. Um, this is Bowen and Guten in um, demography. This self-rated health, this is very widely used in health research in a variety of fields. Part of the reason is so easy to collect. You just ask a person to um, rate their uh, health on a five-point Likert scale, which has labels to it. It also is popular because it's demonstrated predictive validity. You know, it's pretty good at predicting uh, morbidity uh, or even mortality for individuals when future data are collected. It has the added advantage because it is so easy to collect that it appears in a number of surveys. Now the choice of models, as I've said a couple of times, really is pretty arbitrary for people who have looked at this self-reported health and longitudinal data. Autoregressive fixed and random effects, growth curve models, really no systematic comparisons across the models. And this is the, you know, the typical scenario is, I'm gonna use a growth curve model and cite, 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 cite. Other people use growth curve models and that's enough justification. Or I'm gonna use the fixed effects model, cite, 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 right? You know, each of these models has lots of sites and um, that's what people do to justify uh, the choice of it. Uh, we can say that in the review we looked at, there were very few studies that even looked at measurement error um, in this self-reported health. Uh, we had done another paper where we found the reliability somewhere around 0 0.5, 0 0.6, just too, high, uh, too low to uh, ignore. So model selection, which situation are we in? Does theory dictate a specific model? No. Are there different longitudinal models in the literature for the same outcome? Yes. Is a model suggested explicitly? No. Implicitly, maybe. You know, so we're not, we're not quite sure what model we should use. So if my screen will change to data, I can see it at the top there, but not quite there yet. I mean, there it is, okay. So we actually replicated our analysis on two different data sets, but I'm gonna focus on the one that has the greatest number of waves. This is um, of one that's very popular in the States, a National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, uh, 1997. It's got 17 waves of data between 1997 and 2015, and it's a nice large sample, uh, 8984, so 8,984. The National Longitudinal Study of um, uh, Adolescence to Adult Health, this is often known as Ad Health, this also is a very popular data set. It has five waves and quite a large sample. So, Let's look at this. Longitudinal models corresponding to enduring, lagged effects, life course, and hybrid perspective. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate these models that we went over earlier, and we're going to compare these models. When they're nested, we can do chi-square test comparisons. But even if they're not nested, we have the BIC, and we have measures like the Comparative Fit Index, the Tucker-Lewis Index. Uh, the RMSEA, I tend to use one minus the RMSEA because then you get the same standards that are used for the TLI and the comparative fit index. Uh, this is something I suggested uh, a long time ago on SEMNET. Um, if you look at the guidelines for the RMSEA, normally it's 0.05 or lower, or you don't want to be above 0.10. Well, if you just subtract that from one, you end up with very similar guidelines to what people give for the comparative fit index, Tucker-Lewis index. 
And when you're writing for a non-technical uh, audience, it's easier just to tell them all these measures are closer to one it is, the better the fit, you know, rather than reversing. Um, as has been true in other large sample studies I've done, I have found the BIC particularly helpful. The way I'm reporting is not the way that it is reported in M plus, uh, Levon, and some of the other packages. Um, there's an easier way to do it. Uh, uh, very quickly is chi-square minus the degrees of freedom times the log of the sample size. If you do it that way, a negative value means that there's a better fit for your hypothesized model than the saturated model. A positive value means the saturated model has a better fit. I wish the programs would change it. It's a lot easier to interpret that way. We're using single indicator latent variable models for the subjective um, health. And this is just refresh your memory of the different models. I'm gonna show you the fit statistics, but I wanna um, uh, remind you of what these are corresponding to. So this is kind of the, uh, this is the enduring influence one. Latent variable that's influencing each wave of the data. This is the autoregressive lag values influenced in current value. This is the linear growth curve model. This is the quadratic growth curve model. Any second now, we'll get the other, let's see. Ah. And this is the freed loading one. All right, so here's the, the output. Um, yeah, so part of the problem is I don't know people's background here, but let me just, let me just put it this way. The CFI Tucker Lewis uh, index and the one minus RMSEA, a value of one is ideal fit, the best fit. For the BIC, the more negative it is, the better the fit of the model. So here we have this latent time invariant with freely uh, estimated intercepts at each wave of data. So this is the enduring effect model where we just had that single factor influencing each wave. The bigger the chi-square, the worse the fit for given degrees of freedom. So this is really big chi-square. The BIC is not so hot. Uh, if you were somebody who's just reporting the comparative fit index, Tucker Lewis and this RMSEA, you would end up uh, perhaps even making a case for it, which is unfortunate because we can see there are better, um, better models for it. Hmm. I'm trying to get back to that. Not quite sure I'm having that trouble. always showing up it just takes some time yes yes you have to be a bit patient <laughs> okay that's hard for me me too all right so here's what's interesting about this one i think well i don't know what people would say is the simplest model but in my book the autoregressive is a really simple model and look at its fit it really did so much better than that latent time invariant with that uh, 353, 119 degrees of freedom. But the BIC, it's the only minus one here and it's quite a large minus one. Even if you're uh, focusing on the CFI, TLI and the one minus RMSEA, they're very close to their perfect value. So that's quite good. But here's the growth curve model, linear growth curve model. Its chi-square is so much bigger it does have more degrees of freedom than the autoregressive, but it's um, chi-square is so much larger. The BIC is quite large, positive, which is not good. I mean, this is the problem with people just are using these CFI, Tucker Lewis, and RMSEA. If you just use that, you could defend this thing and not give it a second thought uh, for people who don't pay um, much attention to the chi-square, right? You could say, well, that's a, that's a good fitting model. You know, I have no problem with that. Um, and then the quadratic one, this seems to have a, uh, a better fit than the linear, does have a better fit than the linear growth curve model. And the freed loading one, uh, that seems to be not as good as the linear or the quadratic. But if we just looked at 
there's two two points to keep in mind here. If you did the typical study where you don't consider alternative models, I could write you a story to defend any one of these, right? With the fit statistics and their current practice and norms. You know, the story is, well, yeah, the chi-square is large, but it's a really super large sample, but look at the comparative fit index and Tucker-Lewis uh, and the RMSEA, I wish they were a little larger. You know, you would find people defending, could, who could defend it. It's only in comparison to these other models we see, wow, that autoregressive is doing a lot better. A simple autoregressive model is beating these other more complicated models. But we've not considered the hybrid models yet. So let's look at the hybrid models. I'm being patient. Yeah, if I push it again, I'm afraid I'll go too far. Hmm. This time it's a true test of patience. <laughs> I'm going to hit it one more time because my lack of patience. Oh, yep. Okay, see, it pays not to be patient. All right. So this is the latent variable alt freed loading growth model. This BIC is much better. Look at these other ones, even though, you know, they're, they're right near one, the chi-square is a lot lower. So the latent variable alt model is actually doing um, better than those non-hybrid models we looked at. The linear growth one, it also is doing better. And according to the BIC, the latent variable alt linear growth is superior to the freed loading growth model. And the quadratic one comes in between those two. Now, what is not being shown here, right? We're just looking at overall fit. We also want to look at the individual terms. It turns out that the slope term has a mean that is no different than zero and has variance no different than zero, which is suggesting it's not needed, that we don't need to have a slope in this model. And the latent variable alt with only the intercept actually turns out to be the best model on all the fit statistics you know, that we have uh, access to. And we do then have significant parameter terms here. So let me show you the picture of this one. So this is the model that is doing the best. Uh, just as a reminder, so these L's here, these are the self-reported health removing measurement error from them. The Z's are the survey questions you know, that have measurement error in them. So we're controlling for that measurement error. And this alpha can differ over individuals. So there is this enduring effect for each individual, but there's also an autoregressive effect that's driving the self-reported health for people. So both those ideas are consistent you know, with these data. The subjective health uh, has a fairly high um, autoregressive coefficient is about 0.85 here. The reliability of the self-rated health, we can also extract that from the model. It's about 0.6 in this data set and doesn't vary much over time. And the model structure and age explain much of the variation in that latent subjective health variable, about 90% of the variance. I don't have time to go over it, but you can look, if you're interested, you can look in our article. We looked at this across gender and race and ethnic groups, and we found the same model uh, had the best fit, and we found fairly similar coefficients, too. Now, I did say that we had, um, let me see how time is doing. Yeah, okay. Um, a comparison to add health, it's fewer waves of data. But the bottom line of the story is that the latent variable alt intercept one was the best fitting. So we did the same process, ended up at the same uh, place. Again, I ran through this very quickly, um, but you can find this, uh, if you're interested, you can find more details on the analysis in this article.
So I'm trying to get to the discussion slide now. I'm going to push it one more time. There we go. Okay. All right. So this self-rated health example, it illustrates model selection when there's competing ideas. The competing ideas are just that people use different models in the literature. It shows from the point of view of these theoretical ideas that are out there, there appears to be some merit to this idea of an enduring effect as well as lagged effects. And we've replicated that in two different data sets. Now, this same approach that I took here could be taken for other outcomes. I'm not saying to be the same model. In fact, I, I, I doubt it. You, know, you might find different models for different outcomes, but the approach to selecting the model would be the same, even if it's not the same model that ends up being the best fit. What if we you know, don't take this approach of sort of comparing these models? Well, we've got problems. We've got incorrect models percolating in the literature. We've got poor descriptions of the temporal processes going. If we're trying to get causal effects or testing hypotheses, we're not doing a good job of that. If we're basing our um, policies on these empirical research, we have the likelihood of making a mistake. And this is not like extremely complicated stuff to do. You know, this is something that can be done with many existing software. So it's not like we're asking to do uh, customized programming, you know, to write your own program to do it. All this is qu quite simple. Up. And these are just the, um, the references and acknowledgements on that. And I, I would welcome uh, questions or comments. Great, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, now, just imagine lots of happy faces and the round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> That's the downside of Zoom sessions. <laughs> well, I'm used to this when I tell jokes at home. I just no, no laughter. Or anything. Okay. <laughs> um, then let's open the floor to questions. Um, Apparently, I'm no longer the host of the session, so I'm not even sure whether I uh, can follow the Q&A correctly, but this is something Christian does. So if there are any questions in the Q&A, um, Christian, this is great if you could take this over. Yes, I am. Uh, first of all, I will read um, a, a compliment by Rafael Ramirez. Amazing presentation. Can never disappoint as a true scholar. And well, I can only you. second that. Thank you very much for the, um, for the presentation. Then there is a question by um, Joost Reinecke. The models contain different informations. In an LGM, the variance covariance matrix, as well as the mean vector is used, whereas the autoregressive model are estimated on the basis of the variance covariance matrix only. So it's more common maybe than a, than a question. Uh, well, I can actually reply to it. Please. Um, it, it, do you want me to, uh, I can just speak it, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, remember the uh, autoregressive model that was presented had the alpha T in it. The alpha T is an intercept that changes, is permitted to change over time. So the autoregressive doesn't require that uh, we have only the variance covariance uh, matrix. So it is using both the um, alpha, it is using both the intercept and, and, and mean vector, as well as the um, covariance matrix. Okay, um, thank you. Before we, I read other questions from the q and I would like to, um, I see a hand sign here. So I would um, allow Jerome Mulder to unmute himself. This should be possible now. Jerome. Oh, hi, yes, hi. Hi. Uh, I'd be happy to provide a round of applause now. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, um, uh, uh, Ken, for the uh, for the presentation. Uh, I had a question about the ideal scenario that you started your uh, 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 talk with. I was wondering, how does the model comparison, as you've demonstrated uh, in your presentation, relate to the ideal scenario where, well, we have a theory that is so specific so that it provides a lot of guidance for which model to use? Because then I was thinking, yeah, if it's so specific, should we even 
uh, allow ourselves to compare models if the theory is so specific. It's, uh, so it's more of a conceptual question. And a bit related, um, how then does this ideal scenario relate to the inter, uh, interpretability of model parameters? Sometimes I find it difficult to, to truly understand what, what a certain parameter from a model means. Then yeah, is such a model uh, useful for, uh, uh, for, for testing theories then? Yeah. Sure. Uh, both, um, you know, really good questions. Um, if I had uh, substantive writing that was so specific that it dictated, you know, what the model should be. And in fact, if anybody can give me examples, I'd love to have it just to sort of present it and give a site, you know, for something like that. First of all, I'd be extremely grateful. But second, I also would want to know is this really doing an adequate job of describing my data? You know, so maybe I had this theory that it's always the enduring effect, that people always are making these comparisons relative to their peer group. So it's just like a constant assessment. There's a person who's um, always going to be uh, quite optimistic, quite happy, and that's just gonna drive the response throughout until the day they die, right? Mm -hmm. So suppose I have that theory. It's very convincing. I have lots of anecdotes about it. I actually have a model that looks like it's a reasonable fit. But then I find, oh, actually, there's an autoregressive thing going on here. I would have trouble ignoring that. So even if I had that really great guidance, I would be bothered if there was a substantial parameter that's not part of that model that's being dictated that's coming in quite significant. So it, it would raise that puzzle for me. Well, maybe that theory is not complete. You know, maybe we found something here or maybe the theory has to be modified in some way. So I, I hope that addresses uh, your question on that part. But you had a second one, which was on interpreting parameters. And that gives me a good opportunity because I find, <laughs> I found this with the, uh, the alt model and I'm trying to get to the alt model if I can. Let me see if I can, uh, that didn't work. Oh, but this might work. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so for example, more concretely, sometimes I find like the 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 the, the random intercept in the alt model like difficult to understand. Like, so, so what does yes. it mean substantively? And then, like, if if we should be able to, yeah. Uh, uh, if a theory should be so specific that it, uh, uh, yeah, almost prescribes a model, then yeah, if I don't know what an alpha means in the alt model, then how can I ever use it? Yes, um, so that that is a good question. So the way that um, I interpret it is actually a um, couple of different ways. One way, if you look at this equation, what this uh, intercept is referring to. It is a constant effect that's influencing you, each wave of your data. It's a, for it differs over individuals, but it is influencing each person. It's a person specific effect that maintains itself even after you control for a person specific slope and a lagged effect. That's one way that you could interpret it. Another way you could do it is you could subtract, see this row term here times the uh, lag variable, subtract that from ZIT. And the way you could interpret the alpha I then is you could say, even after I remove the autoregressive effect, there's a person specific effect that occurs and a slope effect that occurs. So it's really as simple as just sort of breaking down these terms. What you can't say is that this is the starting point. This is something that is a constant effect that is affecting from a particular individual to uh, each wave of data. And it differs um, across people. Hmm. But at the same time, there is this autoregressive. So another way um, you could uh, interpret it is that Removing the autoregressive effect, there's actually a growth curve pattern of that residual. So if you took 
rho t, t minus one, zi t minus one from zi t, that's kind of residualizing that um, repeated measure. And in that residual, there's a growth curve pattern with alpha i and beta i um, as its primary parameters. Or if you want to go in the other direction, you could subtract the growth curve part of this from ZIT and say, after I remove the individual specific effect and individual slope, there's still a remainder that is um, autoregressive, is predicted by the lag value of that Z. So just a quick reminder to everyone, if you have questions, uh, please use the Q&A if possible and not the chat. And you can also use the Q&A later on and just use the add sign and then Ken um, if you have any questions later on and we can continuously work on um, the Q&A. Given time, I would maybe um, summarize three questions or put together three questions in one. And uh, the question is, what are your recommendations in terms of sample size and N for these kinds of models? So these are two questions people ask in the Q&A. And another question, uh, how is this related to the random intercept cross like panel model? And I should add, I think Ellen is somewhere on the audience. Um, so that would be an interesting aspect to talk about. Sure. So um, sample size, I would handle like any um, structural equation model from the point of view of the more parameters you have, the more complicated the structure. Uh, if you have small samples, we'd expect more instability. So small samples, you know, 100 cases, 200 cases, you know, something in that ballpark. I would expect more instability um, in the uh, in the results and the parameters. And if you start getting non-convergence and you are in that situation, that may be a source of it. And you, you'd have to take the usual type of corrective procedures to see if you could get the model to converge or not. Um, so it's hard, sample size, I'd love to have a particular answer for what sample size should be you know, for <laughs> any SEM, but it depends on many factors. I can tell you this, the higher the R squared for the outcome that you're looking at, you can generally get away with a smaller sample size. The lower the R squared, you probably need a bigger uh, sample. That's one thing that affects it. So there's not one number. If you have a thousand cases, you're probably fine. If you have 100, 200, 300 in that range, I would anticipate um, you gotta be careful. You, you gotta see what comes up when you're doing the analysis. Um, yeah, for the, um, I think uh, my colleague uh, Patrick Curran also has uh, this model from years ago of, of um, residuals. We have cross lagged effects among the residuals rather than among the observed variables. Um, I've not looked at it yet, if it could be fit into the latent variable alt model yet, but that I think is an interesting question. It is something that's not uh, covered by these models, but certainly what we could do today is you could estimate that model and compare its fit with some of the non-nested fit statistics. And I think that would actually be quite interesting to see. And I certainly can't answer because I've not done it um, on this one, but I think it would be interesting to see for um, models that you're looking at, which has the best fit. But then you have the issue of how do I interpret the impact of a disturbance that consists of all the other effects? Uh, they may be real variables, they may be purely stochastic elements. What does it mean to say that that stochastic element is, has a cross lagged effect on something else? But I think it can be added to the mix. Um, and I would encourage you if you think that's a, um, a good representation for your data, just to add it to the mix and see what the data tells you. Because we, I, I don't see a lot of theory dictating one over the other. All right. Again, thank you very much. When 